I'm a doctor, a father, an American, an Indian. I've had conversations about life from every angle. And as I've navigated the South Asian experience, I share stories of people and their purpose. And what they're saying over and over again is, trust me, I know what I'm doing. I'm Abhay Dharndekar, and on this episode of Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing, we're rejoined by religious scholar and activist Simran Jeet Singh, author of the new book, The Light We Give. Stay tuned. Now, one of the many themes of this show is that learning comes from living, and the stories we collect from the past and present inform our future. It's like an ongoing wisdom journal. And speaking of wise, thank you all for listening to the show, for downloading, subscribing, and rating the podcast on your favorite platforms, and for following us on social media, at Dr. Abhaydarnika. It's really good to be back after a brief summer break, and what better way to think of lessons and wisdom than to welcome back our friend Simran Jeet Singh. Simran is the executive director of the Aspen Institute's program on on religion and society, and recognized among Time Magazine's people fighting for a more equal America. His scholarship and activism are simply terrific, as a thought leader focused on outcomes. Simran's also a regular contributor to the Washington Post, CNN, and Time Magazine, so if you haven't seen his work, please check it out. Now, as a pediatrician, I was thrilled to chat with him back in 2020 about his best-selling children's book, Foja Singh Keeps Going, and I was grateful to recently catch up with him as his new book, The Light We Give, The Power of Sick Wisdom to Transform Your Life, released in July. Most pressing, though, we started chatting about a very acute issue for both of us. Sadly, I I can say there's been neither a Laker championship nor a Spurs championship since we both connected. So so we have a lot to to work on here, I think. Yeah, the... The world, the world feels like it's getting worse and, and everyone's feeling that, but, but Lakers fans and Spurs fans are feeling it. It's sharp right now. Uh, yeah, it, it's especially here. acute. I, I agree. <laughs> Listen, you know, so like you said, so much is happening and it feels like so much has happened even since we chatted, even to reflect for a moment. But what does it mean to be to you to, to be an American and a Sikh in 2022? Mm, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I guess the the first thing that really comes to mind is part of my worldview is is expanding in some ways, and and it's becoming easier to hold the complexities of our of our realities at the same time, right? Like there's there's a lot of privilege, uh, a lot of beauty, a lot of opportunity, a lot that I love uh, about being born and raised in this country, and at the same time, I mean. It's, it's really difficult to deny for anyone at this point some of the ugliness of, of our history, uh, but also of our present. And, and we can point to all sorts of inequities across, across the board. And, you know, you can look at things like the pandemic or the murder of George Floyd or the unequal pay in the workforce. I mean, like over and over again, wherever you look, it's all around us. And so, I mean, I, I think this reality that a lot of us feel in 2022 right now, which is there's a big gap between who we are and where we want to be. Mm-hmm. Again, maybe it's because I'm aging and, and reaching maturity in, in some way, or yeah, maybe it's just more clear to us that these are real issues. And, and when the opportunities present themselves, I mean, there was one part early in the book where, where I really appreciated you know, you writing that everyone notices you, yet people don't actually see you. And in some ways, being able to outline that for folks, what do you think has brought about this, in some ways, kind of erosion of, of empathy or asking and digging deeper to understand a little bit more about those around us? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a lot of elements at play um, culturally. Um and, and at the core of it, and, and this is, again, what I've learned through sick wisdom, but I think it's also what I've observed over and over again um, in Western society. And that is we live in a culture that we learn to believe revolves around us, like the world, the country, our families, like everything revolves around us. And, and we become so entrenched in our self-centeredness, right? And we have all sorts of narratives that reinforce that, right? Like it could be something like white supremacy, which tells you you're better than other people by virtue of your skin color, right? Right. Like that's ultimately reinforcing self-centeredness. It could be uh, on the basis of class, right? You deserve more than other people because 
you're smarter or work harder and it's a meritocracy. It could be on the basis of American exceptionalism, right? We are quote unquote, the best country in the history of the world. Uh, and, and it could also be, I mean, something more subtle that doesn't feel like it's reinforcing self-centeredness, right? So like we, we often describe ourselves as the most advanced civilization in human history. And like, in some ways that's true. Like we have more technology than ever before. Yeah. We have more access to knowledge than ever before, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say we're the most civilized yeah. <laughs> like, look or, at, look advanced. <laughs> or advanced, right? Like yeah. the, I, to me, that is actually a really important aspect of our culture that we need to understand. And, and then you see, you know, through something like the pandemic where everyone comes together in moments of need, like essential workers show up and risk their lives and black lives matter happens and people show up and risk their lives. And I really felt like things were changing, right? It really felt different. And then we, over time, like two years pass and you, you, you can feel it slipping through your fingers, right? Yeah. Like now is there are people who are not even willing to wear a mask to help protect other people, right? Yeah. Like, and you might say, well, it's not about you. This is about you making sure other people, and they're like, I don't care about other people. Yeah. And like, yeah. that is happening over and over again. Uh, and, and it's indicating to me that there's something about the way that we think about ourselves and, and how we relate to one another. That's just so ego driven. And then the yeah. question to me that I get from my tradition and I try and write about it in this book is how do we get out of that? Because we know that ego is the cause of so much suffering, right? Like it doesn't ultimately make us happier and, and we can see what it does to us societally. And so we, we need another way. And that's, and that's part of what I'm trying to do in this book. I wonder if we've also, to some degree, we suffer from terminal impatience. You know, when, when we talk about acts of kindness and, and living by our compass and, and, and values for that matter, we sometimes get surprised by, by those moments of kindness. And, and yet we probably shouldn't be, right? I mean, if we just dug a little bit deeper, we'd probably see them much more frequently, but are we just simply too impatient or, or for that matter, not necessarily willing to, de to devote the time and the energy and the effort that it takes to, in fact, talk and develop connection and, and really engage in, in what people have to offer. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good point. I mean, I, I, I think like human, human psychology is you are, you are drawn to identify the negative and there, and it's a survival instinct, right? Like that's, that's where your focus is. And, and there's thousands of years of, of hardwiring that's, yes. that's gone into, into our brains. And I think that's valuable in so many ways. And at the same time, one of the, one of the real negative outcomes of that hardwiring is we are so inclined to notice the negative and it can create a really pessimistic outlook for us. And, and, you know, one of the things I learned from my parents, I remember, for example, when, when the terrorist attacks of nine 11 happened and then we shut down our house, we locked in and there was, there was a lot of negativity, right? Like during the day we're watching the news, trying to understand what happened to our country in the evenings we're talking with sick leaders around the country, learning about hate crimes that were coming uh, against our own community. And there was so much, there was so much negative, I mean, death threats at our home and, you know, on the phone and people driving by. And I remember in that moment when it would have been so easy to dwell on all the negative, my parents pointed out something that I hadn't noticed, which was, Hey, notice how many more people are actually showing their support. Right. And like, it was true, but it never registered for me, right? Like our yeah. classmates and teachers and neighbors and everyone was coming by calling, you know, sh just checking in on us. Yeah. And then the lesson from my parents in that moment, and it's really stuck with me is if you, if you just look, if you're willing to look around, you'll notice that the world is so much more good than bad. There's so much more light than darkness. And, and that lesson, even in, in the most difficult moments has given me uh, a lot of comfort, not, not in a, in a escapism kind of way, but in, in really just practicing to recognize the truth of our world. And you unwind this so, so beautifully when you're talking about different instances of trauma, including the ma massacre in, in Wisconsin, the uh, elements of 9-11 and, and how people are able to sort of see that almost brilliantly. There, there's one part of the book that I actually loved, which was the story about being at the grocery store and shoplifting 
<laughs> but but learning about doing the right thing, right? And as, as soon as I read that, I was wondering about how to grapple with those who, I mean, really staunchly believe in retribution and punishment as the vehicle for justice, as opposed to sort of justice through compassion and sweetness and and love. I'm just so curious about the conversations that you might have with people who are are really pinned to that idea that justice has to happen through a transactional retribution or or the the punishment, if you will. Yeah, well, first I'm I'm embarrassed that you brought up that that story about shoplifting. I have never told in my life. It's the first time I'm ever telling it is through this book. And so the yeah. world, world will know, like, I mean, honestly, one of, one of, one of my shameful secrets, like it was, it was just sure. between me, like my brothers don't even know. And so, but it was, it was really this formative moment for me around understanding the importance of integrity. And like, it wasn't, it wasn't even a lesson about, you know, why stealing is wrong, which could, it could have been, but for my mom in that incident, uh, it was really important for her to communicate to me why it matters that we do the right thing. Yeah. And it's not something I'd ever thought about before. I was still young. I was probably in middle school. And yeah, I mean, part of part of the takeaway, I'm, I'm really interested that you picked up on this because it's it's not something I say explicitly in the book, but but there there is something really interesting about the pedagogy in that moment because I, I mean, I fully expected to get the book thrown at me, right? Like either, either literally or, or figuratively, which was like in our house, it wasn't really grounding, but it was definitely losing, losing privileges is is kind of what happened. Like taking away books or taking away basketball time or whatever, video game time. So that's, that's what I expected. And instead it was this like really earnest conversation and, and thinking back now on the impact that that had versus the impact of a, Hey, go, go sit in your room and don't play basketball for tonight. Like, yeah, that would have sucked for a day. And then the next day would have been fine and nothing would have changed. Right. And so to me, the, the lesson here from a, from a parenting or pedagogical or justice perspective, like all of, all of these relationships we have in which we have power and we have opportunities to help people, they're all governed by so often this feeling of, um, we, we have to dole out punishment to ensure people get what they deserve for doing the wrong, for breaking the rules, for doing right. the wrong thing. And to me, that's never really made sense. I think because those kinds of reactions are so often born out of anger or hate or fury or rage, or I mean, all, all of these things that don't really figure into my way of trying to live in this world, right? Like my sick faith teaches me like what, what, what are the values I want to live by? What, what informs your actions? And it's like love, yeah. service, compassion, justice, like that's what I want to do. And so what sense does it make when someone missteps, whether it's a kid doing something harmless, like taking a Snickers bar or, or something worse. Right. And, and we have all sorts of examples of that. Like yeah. what sense does it make to make things worse? And, and so for me, the, the question has become, what, what does it take to break those cycles when they show up in your life and they show up all the time. But I, I, the best that I've learned is in those moments, you just have to practice understanding what your values are and trying to live by them in those moments and saying, okay, if, if my values are compassion and service and justice, what does that look like Mm -hmm. in this context? And then trying to create a response that, I mean, it's a lot harder uh, right. It takes a lot more patience to your point about impatience. But, but I think to me, at least, it's, it's the only way that really makes sense. I love the quote that you threw in there um, with Cornell West, who talks about justice being what love looks like in public. And that's such a contemporary way to think. And yet there's so much historical context um, to this. You, you bring up so many different historical episodes, and it, it made, certainly made me think of the experiences of Guru Arjan and Guru Tegh Bahadur and, and the countless sort of persecution stories that you share in the book, you know, even the bullying story that you brought up in the book where, you know, someone's just horsing around in, in the locker room and they remove your turban and and that provoked a, a response, you know, for you. What has to be learned from contemporary episodes like that, from historical episodes like that, 
in order to, like you said, break, break the cycle to bend towards empathy, love, connection, as opposed to escalation and anger and retribution? Yeah, it's such a tough question because I think, I think what we're all really good at is like, we all know the right things to say. Like, I think it's becoming more and more clear to us as we practice saying the right things, what it is that we're supposed to say in order to score the social points. Yeah. And, and I think the, the, the difference though, is that even though people know the right things to say, they don't actually do them. Yeah. And so to, to your question about what needs to happen, I mean, I, I think, and I, and I, you can philosophize, you can learn, you can read all the books you want. Like the, the sick dudes talk about this all the time. Like Guru Nanak Sahib talks about like, you can, you can read as many books as you want. You can become a scholar. If you're not living by it, who cares? Like it makes right. zero, zero difference in your life. Yeah. If it's just knowledge, right? You need to turn that into wisdom by practicing it. That feels like what's lacking. Yeah. And, and I, I'm not, I'm not just pointing my finger outwards and saying, this is what sure. everyone does. Like I'm, I'm equally guilty in this, but it, it does feel like there is a culturally, there's a, there's a lack of self-awareness. Like we are not even, we're so caught up in our public presentation of look at how good we are that we don't even realize that that's not actually who we are. We're just pretending. Right. And I think, I think deep down we know yeah. and that, you know, hypocrisy, it never, like you never can deceive yourself and your heart enough so that you're not actually be believing what it is that you're announcing. But, you know, Baba Farid, for example, he talks about hypocrisy pretty directly. He says, um, uh, jin sahi sachya, jin man hor mukhor se kande kachya. He says the, the true lover is one who lives by the truth. Jin sahi sachya, jin man hor mukhor. Whoever has one thing in their heart and says something else, like they are called kachya. They're called uh, raw or un underdeveloped, right? They're immature. And I think about that a lot because I think there's a lot of hypocrisy in, in each of us, certainly, and, and also in our, in our society and in our culture of, of what we're seeing now, it's, I think it's especially stark that we all say the right things, but we're not actually living by them. And, and that delta uh, between those two things, it just, it causes so much pain for each of us in our daily lives. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. You gave a commencement speech at a local university here in the Bay Area, not UC Berkeley, by the way. Um, but but another institution that I perhaps won't name, um, you you talked about Sikh teachings of oneness and love and service. And I'm curious to know now that you think about them, when you feel yourself periodically straying into that with that hypocrisy, straying from these principles, what are some of the ways you catch yourself and, and bring yourself back? Mm. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, I, I would say there are, there are a ton of examples, you know, one, one that's probably really mundane is, is following like dietary discipline. Mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is just like eating healthy. Yeah. Like it's one of my bigger struggles throughout my life. Like I love exercising. I've always like loved sports. Like that's, that's not my issue, but I also love, I love my food yeah. <laughs> and that is my issue. And so this is not, this is not like the most like spiritually elevated example, but like there is, there is something really powerful about recognizing what your weakness is and committing to it and, and, and building it. And like one of, one of the things that I talk about in the book is, is what does discipline have to offer us, especially in a context where so often as we shed our, you know, quote unquote, institutionalized or organized religions, one of the things that I, I, I'm seeing people lose is, is the discipline element of it. And so to me, the, the practice of discipline is really about creating mental fortitude, right? Like making yeah. yourself internally strong. And like, it could be for me, something like, like eating. Uh, one of the other examples that I give in the book is, is about social media. Yeah. And like finding myself getting so absorbed in the game of social that I, I sort of lose track of what's actually important, right? Like it's, it's so easy to slip into, Oh, I'm doing this because it's fun, which I, I right now I'm not finding it that fun, but in the past I have, right? Like it, yeah. it, I really enjoyed it. And then I'm like, Oh, I need to do this because it's helping to advance this issue I care about or my right. work. 
And then, and then you start finding yourself slipping into really quickly, like how many, how do I measure how many people yeah. are paying attention to this issue right. that I'm sharing? And then all of a sudden you're like, how many likes did this get? And like, yeah. that's it. Right. Like that's, so it's, it's such a fine line. I've fallen, I've fallen on the wrong side of it a few times. Like that moment of acknowledgement is really the first step and it's often the hardest, but if you are willing to actually take that seriously, like be humble enough and self-aware enough to like accept that you're messing up, Mm. confess it to yourself and then say, I'm, I'm, I care enough. I'm going to do better. Like, I, I don't think there's any shame in it. Yeah. Right. Like we're all human and we're not, none of us is perfect. And so that's fine. Yeah. And then the actual path can get easier and easier from there. Well, and the, the idea of doing it in, in a group it, with, you know, other mm-hmm. motivators around is huge. Um, the, yeah. the oneness piece that, um, that you talk about, I'm, I'm so fascinated about, you know, is it possible for us to build community and we see oneness by seeing ourselves in one another while still celebrating and highlighting what sets us apart in, in a positive way. Um, you know, does, how does that come back to representation and visibility and, and being able to stay connected with folks in a community while also just truthfully celebrating what makes us you know, unique individuals? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's one that, I think especially in, in Western and American culture is, is vexing for people yeah. uh, because so often our approach to thinking about diversity is, is still very self-interested it, in the past. It's, it's not so current anymore, but there was a lot of conversation around tolerance, right? There was, there was a point at which tolerance was the bar and then people would say, well, we should, we should do better than that. And like, sure, that's, that's true. But I, I think very much that, spirit is underneath our way of thinking about diversity, which is like, I, I need to learn to accept you for who you are, but I'm still better than you. <laughs> and, like, and, and like, it's, it's so deeply rooted in, in ego that like, it doesn't, I, I think this approach, regardless of how much effort we put by it, will, will, will effectively yeah. ineffective uh, because we still are creating hierarchies of who's better and who's worse in our own mind. So is the, is the answer for the most part that, you know, we, we really, really need to make a concentrated effort to just check our egos at the door whenever we're at worst, uh, you know, keeping our egos at the door when it's more important, but, but even keep keeping our egos in check, no matter what kind of interaction that, that we're in. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Guru Nanak says this in, in his own writing. He says, Ham nahi change, buran nahi koi. like I'm, I'm not good and no one is bad. And yeah. like that to me is, is the paradox, right? Like if we can get beyond this binary way of thinking where we're so committed constantly to putting people in boxes and categorizing the world around us, right? Like it's so basic to how we understand the world. And also it's so corrosive. Yeah. And so how do we get beyond that? And, and I think from, from the Sikh tradition, what I've learned is there, there, there really is a different way of, of looking at the world. And it's, it's through this prism of oneness, yeah. which is you can have multiplicity, you can have diversity, all of that stuff. If you understand it as diverse expressions of that oneness. And then that's, that's sort of the, the metaphor at the, at the, at the title of the book, the light we give, yeah. like so many religious traditions uh, use light as a metaphor for that same kind of idea that there is some sort of intangible, unempirical spirit uh, that is tying this world together. And, and that's, that's what I'm trying to get at here, at least from my understanding of Sikh teachings. Is there a danger in some ways to brand ourselves as South Asian American, Sikh American, Indian American, because of the reactions or the perceptions that it then creates in, in, in others to perhaps look at us differently, to make that sort of differential automatically. Mm-hmm. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? Like there is, I think human nature is and will be to understand the world by breaking it down into component parts. So like, yeah. it's not just, you know, the identities we create for one another, but like, I'll show you this and you'll be like glasses, right? Like it's, it's You're just a glasses a- wear, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. And so like, we, we just understand the world by 
by, by what we comprehend, by what we perceive. And like, I, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong right. with doing that. I think the challenge then becomes when we put value judgments based on those categories, right? So if, if, if I show you these glasses and you're like, oh, that guy wears glasses, he's not as good as me for whatever, like he's a dork or yeah. whatever, right? Like then that's, then, that, then you're getting yourself into trouble. Well, and if I, but at the same time, I might say, oh my God, that guy's, he's part of my tribe. <laughs> yeah, we're the, we're the same. Uh, <laughs> um, but I do think there's something deeper here around identity. And, and the, the modern construction of, of identity, the Western understanding of identity is very much hierarchical. Yeah. And, and so as we, as we fall into these labels, I mean, a lot of times we don't even get to pick these labels, but as they are assigned to us or as we learn to embrace them or, or whatever that relationship is, understanding that even if we are net neutral on, on those groupings or those identifiers were actually part of a larger system in which those groupings are assigned value. Yeah. And, and you fall, I mean, within the American context, like there's whiteness and then there's blackness and then there's everything in between, right? Like that's kind of how we've structured it. And so where, where are Asians, where are South Asians, where, I mean, all of these other identities. So, so there is something really pernicious about this particular way of understanding and organizing our world only because historically it's been created in such a way and infused so deeply that we, we, we don't really have the opportunity to escape it and, and make it a clean break from, from all of the value judgment that's, that's assigned to it. I wanted to ask you one last thing. And, and that is in crafting this really wonderful book in thinking about the journey that you had both in writing the book and now, in many ways, sharing the book and, and living the, the book. I'm so curious about how you think about this, particularly as a parent and how, you, you know, in sharing all the experiences of you growing up, what have been some of the surprises and even the, the lessons that you've captured for yourself as you witness your own children going through this journey now and experiencing it from a perhaps different lens? Well, I haven't, I haven't really thought about that. I, I'll tell you, there, there is one element that I have been noticing with my kids and they're, they're young. And it is that the essence of these lessons, when you, when you distill them to their core, they're so simple and they're so easy to grasp. And, and, and one of the, one of the things I've been thinking about is, man, we've like as a society just made such a mess of it, first of all, but then also we've just made it so complicated to figure out the solutions and like, how easy would it be for us to go back to the lessons we learn as, you know, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds of like, Hey, everyone, everyone is equal. Everyone's made from the same clay, right. As, as a bunch of religious traditions uh, describe it, everyone has the same light, and therefore you treat everyone equally and no one is supposed to have advantages or disadvantages based on where they're born. I mean, it's, it's like the kids can understand it. And for some reason we probably understood it as kids and have somehow lost it. And so that that's actually been really, I mean, it's surprising and it's frustrating and it's also beautiful to recognize how profound such simple messages can be and how, I think the beauty of it is also how easy it can be to then apply these teachings to our lives if we really try, right? It doesn't have to be some really complicated formula or reading a ton of books and putting together all, all these sorts of exercises and practices. Like it can be really simple. And I, at least I felt that way as I've tried to live by it and, and found myself improving in certain ways. And yeah, I, I, I do think there's something really interesting there. Well, that beauty and that simplicity and that practicality, I think that comes through so loudly in the book. And, and thank you so much for sharing it with all of us. Um, Simran, what a treat to, to host you again. And I hope we can do this again sometime. No, same. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out. Good to talk to you again. Thanks so much, Simran. The Light We Give is available wherever books are sold. And check out more at simranjeetsingh.org. Till next time, I'm Abhay Darnikar. 
Hi, this is Lara Dada, and you're listening to Ruckus Avenue Radio. 